Selma Schimmel at ASCO 2011 in Chicago, and we're talking to physicians here about the latest research and clinical advances across many different cancer types, and now we're joined by one of the group room favorites, Dr. David Quinn, medical director, USC Norris Cancer Hospital, leader of the Developmental Therapeutics Program, and head of genitourinary oncology, all at USC where you're also uh, an associate professor, amongst other things, at the Keck School of Medicine. Thank you. Let's move into treatment because there are some new compounds and it seems that every time I talk to you that there is a little more light shining on uh, Indeed. prostate research. So we, we talked earlier uh, about the circulating tumor cell studies with the, uh, the new uh, drug that's just been approved called abiraterone. This is... Uh, an androgen biosynthesis inhibitor uh, that acts within prostate cancer cells to suppress uh, testosterone similar androgen molecules to a very low level and produces a response in patients that have uh, that are on androgen deprivation therapy in the form of injections with things like Lupr Lup Lupron, uh, uh, Zolidex, what have you. And patients may know this also drug by the name of Zytiga? Zytiga is the brand name, yes. Abiraterone is the first uh, of a new generation of androgen biosynthesis inhibitors uh, that acts similar to a drug that we used to use uh, very often uh, called ketoconazole, uh, which is an antifungal but also inhibits some of the same pathways as abiraterone but not as effectively. And um, abiraterone represents a significant advance in the phase three trial that we have for patients after chemotherapy, we did get an overall uh, survival advantage and, uh, of four months. Uh, and in many patients who went on to uh, the Cougar 301 study, that particular study, uh, they're still on abiraterone. So there are some long-term responders. Um, and we're waiting for data uh, from the earlier study called Cougar 302. Um, which was done in patients that had not yet had chemotherapy, and we hope that those results will also uh, be positive. Importantly, this is the first of a raft of new uh, inhibitors of the androgen pathway that are going to be more effective. Uh, we'll see data from Takeda Millennium, a uh, company study uh, uh, from uh, Dr. David, uh, David Agus at USC, presented on a drug called TAC700, uh, which looks to have very significant efficacy in phase two and where we're working out whether it needs to be given with prednisone because the, with abiraterone it looks like you need to give prednisone in a majority of patients to control the blood pressure and also the potassium uh, which can be a little erratic and that carries with it some side effects of chronic corticosteroid uh, usage uh, in patients that are already prone to, to weight gain because they're androgen deprived. And so uh, what we're looking at in, in that particular study is to see whether uh, we need to give prednisone and also what dosing schedule of TAC700 we should look at. And again, these are for gentlemen with advanced prostate cancer. Correct. We, uh, we start at the, the bad end, I guess, uh, and we, we start studying uh, men, men with bad disease uh, before we move it earlier. And the promise of moving these things earlier is, is to try and increase the cure in men with with uh, bad but perhaps localized uh, cancer. Um, so we talked about TAC700. Uh, we also will see a little bit on a, a drug uh, called Medivation 3100, uh, which is a, a new generation uh, androgen receptor inhibitor that binds to the androgen receptor irreversibly and, and stops it going to where it stimulates the prostate cancer cell, which is the nucleus. Um, and this is uh, similar to prior drugs that we've had uh, in its basic mechanism of action in binding the end receptor, such as baclutamide, which is also called casodex, uh, uh, flutamide, which is also called ulexin. Uh, but those drugs don't bind uh, to the point where they stop the uh, androgen receptor going into the nucleus. Uh, so it looks like uh, Medivation 3100 is the first of a series of drugs that will be more effective in doing that. And there are impressive uh, data presented at GU uh, ASCO earlier this year uh, in February of 2011 that uh, showed very significant 
uh, long-term control than more than 50% of patients uh, who had not uh, had prior chemotherapy. So uh, it looks like this group of agents, uh, uh, the, the newer drugs could be much more effective than their predecessors uh, and actually change therapy and really provide us with another avenue of control for prostate cancer. For men with bone metastases, cabazanatinib? Uh, cabazatinib, yes, XL184 uh, is an interesting uh, drug. We'll see uh, data from my colleagues at uh, Michigan, uh, uh, from uh, previously presented by David Smith um, uh, at uh, the EURTC NCI AACR meeting last year uh, on uh, some very striking uh, results with uh, XL184 in patients with prostate cancer with rapid normalization of, of very abnormal bone scans. Uh, patients laden with metastases uh, where uh, their bone scan uh, can uh, in some instances normalize and their pain goes away. What we'll see from uh, Dr. Smith's colleague, uh, Maha Hussain, also from Michigan, uh, is, is an update where uh, we'll have some further follow-up on these patients uh, looking at, at uh, what longitudinal control we seem to get. Also documenting that some of them get the elevation of their PSA at the same time they appear to be responding in bone and raising questions about uh, what we're seeing. Uh, some people feel that the changes in, in the bone scans are just a little too rapid and maybe a biochemical effect of this uh, particular agent in XL184 targets the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor, similar to other drugs we have, um, such as sunitinib, uh, serafinib, and pazopinib used in renal cell cancer, uh, but also targets a, another novel uh, transduction pathway called CMET, which is quite important for bone metastases. What we're going to see with, with this agent is we're going to get more experience about its side effects, uh, and it does have uh, significant chronic side effects in some patients that may limit its use somewhat, but should not uh, preclude its, its development because we've now got quite good at managing uh, the side effects. Uh, and we need to work out a little bit more about how it's working. And there are some very uh, novel protocols going forward uh, that are very intense where uh, we'll be uh, at select centers, most particularly MD Anderson with Dr. Logothetis, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, referring patients there that are interested in going on this uh, treatment uh, because they'll have intensive uh, imaging with uh, MRI, special MRI scans, dynamic PET, and also uh, biopsies of bone metastases uh, to try and work out what the underlying mechanism of action will be. And the reason we've, we've placed this in, in one centre is that uh, men that go on this protocol are going to need to be really motivated uh, to get all that imaging. Uh, they're going to be in Houston at MD Anderson for a significant part of the time and they're going to have to uh, be willing to go through the invasive uh, bone biopsies that not everyone really necessarily wants to have. Uh, I think we will see uh, this particular drug uh, move forward uh, in further studies and I understand that uh, Exelex is the company uh, that makes the compound are planning some phase three studies which should be be interesting uh, and a, this is a novel mechanism of action although we have seen uh, some responses with normalization of bone scan and, and uh, elevation of PSA in a prior set of studies uh, done with serafinib uh, at uh, the National Cancer Institute and also at uh, the University of British uh, Columbia. The UMABs or the UMABs, the, the, this classification. The MABs. Right. Yep. Um, so then there's uh, den denosumab, the exgeba. Yes. So these are monoclonal antibodies, and denosumab is a monoclonal antibody to the rank ligand inhibitor, um, or it's a rank ligand inhibitor. It's actually a monoclonal, the rank, uh, which inhibits that pathway and inhibits uh, bone eating from, from things called osteoclasts. Uh, for seven or eight years in prostate cancer, we've had a, a drug called subhydronic acid, or Zometa, which is a bisphosphonate. These drugs uh, and, par and, and that family are osteoclast inhibitors that act in a particular way. This new compound that's come along, denosumab, has been compared in a series of studies across uh, different uh, cancer types, but most particularly uh, and, and prevalent to the current conversation, prostate cancer. And 
uh, denosumab has demonstrated an advantage in delaying what we call a skeletally related event in patients that have bone metastases from prostate cancer already. And it, it delayed uh, the development uh, by two to three months uh, compared to what was our standard with uh, zeledronic acid. And we're still learning the compound has been licensed uh, for, for delay and prevention uh, of these events uh, in, in the patients. We're learning about some of the side effects. Uh, it can drop the calcium a little, little low, and usually these uh, patients are gonna need to be on calcium and vitamin D to uh, help their skeleton anyway, and we'll we usually just elevate the dose of that and it helps. Uh, and osteonecrosis of the jaw, where you can get a, a nasty uh, hole adjacent to your teeth, uh, which is a rare but uh, uh, quite bad side effect that's shared both by denosumab and, and, and bisphosphonates. All right, Dr. Quinn, it seems that the whole prostate cancer landscape has become extremely uh, intense with um, targeted therapies, opportunities for personalized approaches. So my question is for the average man who gets diagnosed with prostate cancer, the majority of patients get treated in the community. Sure. More and more as I listen to you, it sounds like it really would behoove patients to get an additional academic evaluation because there's a lot of clinical trials and research going on that you may not be able to access unless you get to an academic center of excellence. Well, I, I think that's true, and I think it's worth uh, getting an opinion at different junctures. And uh, what, what men need to understand is when they come for those trials, there's a bit of a risk that they take. And, and it's difficult when we say to someone, well, you're on standard therapy at the moment. I have something additional to offer you, but it's compared to a placebo. Now, usually in that situation, we're very careful to watch that patient, and it's, it's difficult. Uh, but uh, some of those, these patients who've gone on the placebo control trials of uh, vaccine therapy, Ciplicel T or Provenge, uh, Abiraterone, uh, Medivation 3100, uh, and uh, potentially some, some other agents to come, uh, are still with us and, and didn't expect to be. So perhaps I need to rephrase that differently and, and suggest that men with metastatic disease or men with more advanced prostate cancer would benefit from learning about some of the clinical trials that are available that with more advanced disease you might not be able to find sure. in and the private practice. I think that in academic centers you're going to, you're going to get a look at that that's, that's much better. And if you go to one of the bigger academic centers, you're not just going to get off of the trials they're running at that time uh, if you fit for another trial. I mean, if, if I have people that I think should be going to one of the other big centers for a particular study that's going to answer a question, and I think they're able to do that, I, I, I will do that. But the majority of patients I want to refer back to the, the community unless I have something really special for them. And the good thing about the drugs we've developed in prostate cancer uh, most recently, and I, I think uh, uh, abiraterone and, and Ciplicel T are good examples, uh, is that they're going to be given in the community. And academic centers also have a responsibility to share that knowledge from the trials so that uh, when, when our, our very good uh, oncology colleagues in the community are starting to use these drugs, they don't just have to start from, from point zero. Uh, we say, okay, well, look, I, you know, I have experience with uh, 20 to 100 of these patients, and, and we try and share that uh, as, as part of uh, education. The idea that one could consult at an academic center, then be treated in the community whereby their private physician has ongoing communication with the academic uh, doctor, to me, that's just the best of all worlds. Well, I think it's, it's a matter of ha having that relationship, and uh, some, some, patients, uh, some patients understand that. Uh, other patients, it's a little bit of a challenge for them, uh, but I think they're reassured by opinions that, that we and other academic centers uh, uh, provide them with. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. David Quinn, Medical Director, USC Norris Cancer Hospital, leader of the Developmental Therapeutics Program and head of Genito Urinary Oncology. Thank you, Sol. And best friend of the group room. <laughs>